Thank you. Um, unlike Christine, who has been told to travel more and get out, this takes us to a scenario <laughs> where most of us have been told to stay a bit more at home and take more responsibility for things at home. Um, this is a presentation between two. John at the front here, um, Herbal, who's the chairman for Inter Herbal International. Um, John Wilner, sorry. We've worked in collaboration on this project, which we're going to talk slightly about. Um, so it's a combination of, of, of a consultancy with, with academics, um, and that partnership has gone back, at least we believe, to the mid-1980s when the Centre for Development Studies at Bath and Herbal have had relationships. The presentation is, is, I want to do two things with the presentation. First of all is to open up the box of what we mean by impact. Because the kind of work that perhaps we are doing, we need to be more aware of what I'm going to call for the moment nested impacts. So tangible benefits immediately to people, but an eye on a bigger ball, a bigger game, that somehow we need to change conditions in order to make those impacts more sustainable. So that kind of, um, that kind of play being brought in on the first the second, of course, is to look at impact at the notion of time. I can have impact which is immediate now, but sometimes there's more sustainable impact if we're looking further ahead. Um, and trying to keep the balance between those two um, is quite difficult. This idea of nested impact and impact over time, I think, comes about precisely because of the kind of projects we've been talking about this morning where people, as opposed to things, are at the immediate centre of our kind of nature of our work. So the programme that we're in currently involved in is um, supported by the UK DFID, Department for International Development, um, and the Government of Bangladesh. It's a programme looking at extreme poverty, and we'll come back a bit to what, why we're talking about extreme poverty. And it's obviously geared towards the Millennium Development Goals 2015. It's a challenge fund, which is innovative in its own right, in the sense that we don't control who necessarily gets the money to take forward these programmes. This is done through a blind peer review process, and our task then is to come in and support that process um, through our research and other things. The aim is to get a million people out of poverty. It sounds a lot. In actual fact, that's not the big prize. But it's an important number to keep in mind. And the programme is set around four key components. Um, one is a scale fund, which is essentially working through NGOs in Bangladesh, non-governmental organisations, who have got experience, who are large enough. This is your Save the Children type figures, who we know can get out big scale, do the programmes and reach the kind of people that we're trying to talk about. The second component is innovation. And this is going to be smaller scale interventions which are trying to take either new ideas or new constituencies and working with them and take that idea forward. The third and fourth are quite tied together and it's where our relationship with Herewell comes in strongest. It's on the lesson learning, what lessons can we draw for this and importantly, how can we take those lessons into another level? In other words, advocacy. There's a story to be told about Bangladesh as I suspect in many other countries in the world and it's a kind of positive story. Not all countries, but many. And so the kind of big figures in Bangladesh tell me that in 1970, 75% of the population were in poverty. And if you look at the figures now, it's down to 40%. Loads of reasons for that. But effectively, because of that combination of dealing with poverty and at the same time creating an economic success of Bangladesh, in the 90s, we had a mantra that we created. We called it pro-poor growth. And Bangladesh was seen as one of the great examples of this pro-poor growth strategy. That's until you start reading some ethnographies from 1910 in Bangladesh, where people are already classifying the rich and the poor in the middle. And the number of the poor people in 1910 is roughly the same as what we've got today as a, in terms of proportion. So despite the pro-poor growth mantra in Bangladesh, what we have in Bangladesh right now is 56 million people still living in poverty. That equates to roughly 40% of the population and 35 of them in extreme poverty, and again, that's about 25%. So what does it tell me about our pro-poor growth? Well, it's been highly uneven, and the success story, that there are important caveats to that success story. The current program we're working on in extreme poverty is a challenge. It's been a challenge for all of us, it's a challenge for those of us who are giving support to it, but it's also been a challenge for those who are supporting it. In other words, DFID, 
and the NGOs who are implementing it. And we've been working with people who are saying, why are we dealing with the extreme poor when we've been so successful dealing with the ordinary poor, if you want? So we're breaking, in many ways, new ground. And in our last meeting with Tiffid, they came out with the sentence that we don't know if we're on humanitarian aid or development aid here. And somewhere, we're on a cusp. Our main discussion, our main argument, the point that we're trying to bring through the extreme poverty is a familiar one. In other words, poverty isn't a homogeneous experience. But more importantly, what we're trying to say is that by calling something extreme poor as opposed to poor, this isn't just about poor being a bit more poor. We're trying to make an argument that the extreme poverty is something which is structurally different from poverty. And the importance of that key argument is if we accept it, then our policy responses also have to be different. In other words, it can't be business as usual. Who are these extreme poor? I'm not going to go into a discussion about the characteristics of extreme poor, but, and I'm sure most of us are aware of this, there are a set of disadvantages, structural, systemic, which are locked together in a way that perhaps ordinary poverty is not quite locked together. But more importantly, from our initial work with these programmes, there are two elements which are coming out. One is that this poverty is reproduced significantly over time and probably through generations. So it's an intergenerational phenomenon. If you're born extreme poor, the chances are that you will die extreme poor, and so will your children. And the evidence we're getting already from our initial survey is that you've got 65, 70% of girls under the age of five who are already suffering irreversible stunting. That doesn't get fixed in this generation. The challenge is, will it get fixed in the subsequent generation? And, perhaps not surprisingly, amongst the people who are the extreme poor, significantly female, for various reasons, but female-headed households well above the 60% of the population who are in the bottom 10% of the poor in Bangladesh. Why the Centre for Development Studies? Well, and why this story about impact I'm trying to untease over time and as well as nested? Well, because partly we're involved in this because of a combination of things, a combination of our own experience, our passion for the things that we believe in, but also our ability then to take that experience and try and work with innovation today. So we're linked. This isn't just about a one-off sheet of paper that we can start devising a programme. So we've got three decades of action research involved specifically in Bangladesh, but other countries as well, trying to look at different mechanisms to reduce poverty. And I would say straight up that the same is probably true of Herwell, although they're not claiming three decades, but two at least. What's the story of the nested impacts? Well, we're trying to take the programme forward, looking at impact at three different levels, and the three levels have to stay together. And this is part of our ongoing history, if you want, of action research. The first level of impact is just at the straightforward level of individuals, beneficiary impact. So what's the evidence that we've had in our past about trying to make beneficiary level impacts? Well, the example is there. There are many others. We're just giving an illustration of it. Working with landless people in Bangladesh, the obvious solution is to try and get them some land to work on agriculture. Innovation, well, let's not get them on land, which is going to cause us a whole series of fights. Let's try and turn them into irrigation groups. And what do these irrigation groups then do? They then sell services to better off landowners and farmers. In other words, you've got 6,000 groups who before had no livelihood and now have a significant livelihood. Second, trying to make change at the level of organisation. Organisation means so that organisations and institutions in the future are better able to deal with poverty. Again, an example, setting up think tanks that are able to engage with big political processes like budget reform. The third, systemic level impacts. And again, these are nested together. And evidence of this, creating work and research that has led, for example, to a governance challenge fund, which is now supporting over 100 organizations in Bangladesh, again, through the work of DFID. Going back, last couple of slides, to the present program. What are we trying to do? The exact same methodology looking at a new group of people, the extreme poor, and trying to get beneficiary impact. So what have we been doing? Mostly asset transfers. Okay? Asset transfers that are giving the bottom 10% something to start their livelihoods with. And, as I've written there, we're on target to deliver that. Secondly, organisational impact. When NGOs come and say to us, 
we have never worked with the extreme poor before, then we've got to scratch our head and say, well, how do we help these very experienced organisations work with a completely new beneficiary group that they hadn't anticipated when they signed up? They thought they could just go on with doing business as usual. And therefore, we're looking at ways of targeting, various ways. We're looking at ways of monitoring. We're looking at ways of taking their, their innovative ideas and trying to bring them up to scale. And the third level is systemic impact. And this is perhaps where, surprisingly, we've had the most tangible and immediate, um, if you want, success in this particular program. So we've been working with the government of Bangladesh in parliament and colleagues from CDS and myself have been giving them sessions. And that's led this year to the creation of the first all-parliamentary group, cross-parliamentary group on extreme poverty. So the idea is that we've got something in place in Bangladesh for the first time to engage the political system to try and change the conditions which will then hopefully, over a longer period of time, help poor people deal with their lives in a better way. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's great. <laughs>